can test and buy a worker. Okay. Oh, oh, this is very good. All right, yeah. try that one. So, 
for the people all in the line. Um, it's called Beyond Pragmatism because it's meant to start a dialogue with the literature where there's a consistent narrative that the Islamic Republic has been a pragmatic actor in the South Caucasus. Uh, I'm not saying non-pragmatic or against pragmatism, I'm saying that there's more to this than the label pragmatism manages to capture. Uh, my problem with this uh, label is that Often, the discourse and even the academic discourse on Iranian foreign policy is articulated around the dichotomy of ideology versus pragmatism. And both the terms are very underdefined. What is ideological is that which is not pragmatic, and what is pragmatic is that which is not ideological. So this contrariety kind of uh, does not create room for digging further and uh, looking into the specificities. So when it comes to the South Caucasus, it's been usually picked up in the literature as a case where the Islamic Republic is not behaving in a revisionist manner, where the values and principles of the Iranian revolution are not very prevalent, where it, it has a more balanced approach. And usually this uh, argument about pragmatism is presented as a conclusive finding. And uh, the, the analysis doesn't go much further than that. I thought it would be better to kind of move away from this dichotomy, recontextualize the issue in a different manner, and, so, and show what ideological detachment means, because it does not necessarily mean that the alternative of ideology is a clear-cut conventional uh, policy. And then uh, from the literature I kind of went to, towards a very unconventional theoretical approach. Um, I will not delve much into this because if I start, uh, I'm going to spend the whole presentation on this. I will just say that it's, it's a theoretical approach that tries to appreciate the complicatedness of Iran's agency as a foreign policy actor and also show the um, dynamic nature of foreign policy making and it's a theoretical perspective that opens up space to appreciate contingencies and nuances. And the way the research questions are formulated also reflect this uh, perspective, specifically how our identities and interests articulated in Iran's foreign policy in South Caucasus, and how do certain policies emerge, get implemented, and work and tested. So I have tracked this the process of Iran's foreign policy from late 1980s or onwards concerning South Caucasus and I've looked into a lot of eventualities and um, many articulations to see how uh, I can bring all of them together and construct an argument regarding the behavior of the Islamic Republic. So uh, I want to present my research, I'm skipping the research design, if you have questions I will be very happy to answer about it. But, uh, I want to um, present the findings in three sections. Um, one refers to the um, policies of the Islamic Republic in regard to region building or regionalism or its attempts at multilateralism. The other theme is Iran's attitude towards regional conflicts and security issues. And the third theme is uh, Iran and uh, bilateral relations with Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia. So, st to start with the first one, uh, the, there's a very interesting dynamic, uh, and uh, uh, we, we can see in the uh, in the date coming, uh, we go back to the 90s. We see that uh, there's a novel situation, both for Iran uh, as well as for the region. Um, all of a sudden, a number of new states emerged in the Iranian horizon in the South Coast and Central Asia. And uh, the Islamic Republic tries to construct a certain approach towards that. And this is where we see uh, Iran's attempts at region building. The Islamic Republic having a very anti Western posture and also advocating for um, multipolarity and construction of independent regions, trying to uh, form a regional unit that would be indigenous 
that it would have limited influence by external powers such as the United States or the West in general. And here um, we can see some traces of these revolutionary narratives which kind of goes against the pragmatist argument because the Islamic Republic invested a lot in the so-called Economic Cooperation Organization, which is an organization that brings together Turkey, Iran, Azerbaijan, states in Central Asia, um, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. So they uh, chose ECO, the Economic Cooperation Organization, as their vision of future building. And first they presented it as an economic entity, but often they started oscillating between uh, having ECO as a power as, as a power that resists Western influence and at the same time trying to show that ECO is a depoliticized unit that cares about economic matters. And this kind of oscillation between this revision side of the organization and also the kind of um, economic side that puts aside ideological proclivities uh, is evident in Iran's behavior. For example, they would say that ECO is an organization for Muslim countries and where the army uh, army government kind of showed interest in February 1992 to join it, uh, it fell on the dead ears. And at the same time, uh, some of the members of the organization challenged this identity that said that we are here for economic reasons and that they want to push back and say the economic cooperation organization is just a uh, have just economic objectives. So what, what, why I'm talking about ECO so much is that there's this unit that includes one state in the South Caucasus, leaves the other two out, and brings religion as a reason, and tries to kind of carry out a mission of religion building based on that. Then this uh, same attitude is kind of see, seen in the case of the Caspian Sea, but they also try to have a kind of regional unit called the Caspian Sea Cooperation Organization, or CASCO, and in this case as well, they were oscillating between two perspectives. One is that it's a depoliticized structure that um, only has economic aspirations, but then at the same time, in, uh, they try to articulate objectives that kind of show the revisionist tendency that this is an anti-Western structure. It's meant to um, Keep the independence of the states in the region. Then, when this institution building activities didn't work, the Islamic Republic started experimenting with a lot of things, and like access building between Iran, Armenia, and Russia, or cooperation between Iran, Armenia, and Greece. They have very ad hoc nature. And the further I try to dig into the see what's the uh, question that behind it. It, it, um, it was clear that they were doing something that Fred Halliday called Siyasat uh, Dastego, which means a policy of bouquet of flowers, meaning that if anyone shows up to, at the Iran airport, they will meet them with a bouquet of flowers. So they, they are very inviting, let's do something, but let's uh, have regional cooperation, but it was not very clear where these initiatives were going. And also, the other stakeholders, such as um, being Greece or the members of the Caspian Sea Cooperation Organization that was formulated later, or the Economic Cooperation Organization, had a certain communication issue with the Islamic Republic because, on the one hand, they were like, I am interested in commercial matters, and on the other hand, you will see revisionist issues coming forward. For example, at one session at Hebo, um, the representative of the Islamic Republic raised the issue of Palestine, Palestinian struggle, and then made anti American comments. And then the member of um, the Uzbekistan side uh, kind of protested against this attitude and then they threatened to leave the organization. So, this is, uh, just, I don't have much to delve into this, but we can uh, discuss further the Q&A section. What I'm trying to say is that when it comes to multilateralism and region buildings, Iran has been experimenting with large factors and leaving things out of way uh, bec uh, because it, uh, it faced a lot of difficulties, but at the same time it was finding it hard to choose a certain 
path and staying on it. And we try to be flexible, but this uh, flexibility was translated into inconsistency and ambivalence by the other states in the region. And also in, in the Iranian perspectives on region building, there is the issue of uh, the engagement with Russia and Turkey. They were neither allies nor, nor enemies. There, is, there, there was some kind of constructive competition between the Islamic Republic and these states. Uh, Iran tried on certain occasions to have kind of ideological merger, especially with Russia, saying that we both are on the path of uh, resisting Western influence in the region, but there was asymmetric commitment to these ideological narratives. And for often the Iran side uh, complained that Russia was not on the same page with it. So that there was this kind of and the uncertainty regarding the role of these two players in the region. And this also hampered Iran's attempts at the um, This is the first thing uh, I tried to present very quickly. The second thing is the uh, regional conflicts and the uh, security infrastructure in the South Caucasus. The, I think many of you might be familiar with this photo. It's, uh, mm -hmm. This during the war in Nagorno Karabakh and the Iranians standing on the shore of the Arks River and just watching the fighting happen. So this, I think, it epitomizes the bystander position of the Islamic Republic in, the, in this conflict and also in the security affairs in the South Coast in general. Uh, one of the key things that I have identified in my research is that Iran is a self-proclaimed regional power, and yet at the same time, it has a very limited influence over the security issues in the region, and this kind of creates frustration and dissonance. The Islamic Republic tries constantly to have a bigger say, but at the same time, it is very cautious and avoids liabilities. The same can be said in the case of the Nagorno Karabakh conflict, and the Iran uh, cultivated a very careful approach, trying to play away, but at the same uh, time not to choose a side, but at the same time they were frustrated and they were marginalized in this process of conflict settlement. And their first attempts at mediation were uh, in 1992, but they failed, and after that uh, Iran was in a position of basically accepting the developments regarding the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and the situation of the latest war confirms this uh, analysis. Uh, the other aspect of regional issues is that the Islamic Republic both try to question the existing security frameworks and at the same time become part of them. So we see the same kind of values happening. The 3 plus 3 framework that is discussed quite frequently nowadays is not a new issue. In early 2000s, the Iranian side kind of made an attempt at shuttle diplomacy, visiting the states in the South Caucasus as well as Turkey and Russia, and saying that the three plus three framework, um, in, including the three states in the South Caucasus, Turkey, Iran, and Russia, as the primary stakeholders of the security infrastructure in the region, and then they formulated in opposition to the OSCE framework, saying that OSCE has uh, primary actors that are Western, extra-regional, they don't have the interest of the region in it. So in this way, the Islamic Republic tries to push its antagonistic other away from the region, try to legitimize the role of OSCE. But there were instances when uh, there was an opportunity, let's say, for Iran to have some kind of affiliation with the OSCE. And this happened during and Mohammad Khatami's presidency when there was a small chance of Iran having a diplomat appointed or affiliated to the OSCE. And the Islamic Republic made an attempt, made an attempt to have this uh, kind of quasi-involvement in the structure even if it was crit critical of this, uh, of this framework itself. But then uh, the, the window closed. But the, what I'm trying to 
is that uh, this anxiety of not having control is expressed in two different ways. In the, on the one hand, Iran tries to show a conciliatory and collaborative attitude to become part of the existing structures. On the other hand, he tries to have, a, have the existing structure dismantled and create ones that are more um, in line with its own position. And so this, in this situation of um, ambivalence and uh, oscillation of the perspective, the Islamic Republic developed a very interesting approach towards the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. And I want to kind of uh, spend a little more time in this case because there is a misperception in the literature. This kind of became a mantra in the field of Iranian studies that Iran supported Christian Armenians against Shia Azerbaijanis in the war in the 1990s. That means that Iran is not a religious retriever, ideological act. This is a very general narrative. But if you dig deeper, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, first, there it is uh, correct that the Islamic Republic uh, tried to avoid liabilities because it has just got out of a very long war with Iraq and tried to enter an era of rehabilitation and reconstruction. So this tried to stay away from getting involved in conflict. Uh, the fact that Iran was uh, had a troubled relations with Azerbaijan is also true, but it wasn't a matter of enmity, it wasn't a matter of acting against Azerbaijan. What Iran did is keeping the borders open with Armenia. But at the same time, it also supported Azerbaijan of refugees. It kind of uh, it sent aid to, to Azerbaijan. But you should also note that in this period, the Islamic Republic was very critical of the process of uh, the Armenian side, especially after summer 1993, when uh, the Armenian forces started going beyond the uh, former EKO territories and uh, kind of taking control over the what was later called liberated or adjacent territories. There is one uh, interesting uh, case that uh, um, is not talked about a lot, but kind of managed to find it in the archives. Because in July, in the end of July 1993, the leader of the, the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khamenei, made a very critical remark of the policies of the Armenian side and he urged the Armenian community in Iran to also restate its position. And the poor Armenian community there constructed a very kind of a, uh, when, when you read the text you realize that it's, it's very weak and hard to understand on purpose but they against the violence and they try to show the Iranian side that they brought it against the violence of the Armenian side but at the same time that the, they did the war in, in a way that they don't directly attack uh, the, uh, the, the Armenians in Nagorno Karabakh or the Armenian side there. But all of this is shown that uh, Iran was like, in a difficult situation when it came to the Nagorno Karabakh conflict and often when you follow the Iranian officials, they say, we want the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict to be separated from our bilateral relations with Armenia and Azerbaijan because they consider it a liability, something that dissatisfies the Azerbaijan side and something uh, that, um, if they choose a, a position of supporting brother Russian nations, to alienate Armenia from them. So, and, but this, um, kind of trying to stay away from the conflict also reprodu reproduces the residual role of the Islamic Republic when it comes to the security affairs in the South Caucasus and in turn goes against its self-proclaimed position of a regional power. So it's, this is why Islam is caught up in this, well, in this cycle of frustration and um, trying to stay away from uh, trouble but at the same time having a passive role and uh, being frustrated about the passive role. And the same can be stated about the conflict in Georgia, 
although uh, in this particular case, uh, the Islamic Republic was more um, vocal about uh, um, protecting Georgia's territorial integrity, and that was enough. It also made such statements in the case of Azerbaijan, but the Fugal Azerbaijan side, it wasn't enough. They wanted more support from Iran. But uh, here as well, in early 1990s, the Iranian officials uh, tried to kind of see an opening for mediation or having good control over the fate of the development here. But uh, later on, they always stopped at a certain point in order to avoid liabilities and in the end reproduce their role as a bystander in the region. Also, the, Iran's position um, regarding the, this particular issue was so weak that it was easy to change during the August 2008 war when the conflict was decontextualized from its original environment and presented in the context of the West versus Russia and all of a sudden the principle of territorial integrity was put aside and the West, the Russia, Russia was lauded for having a, um, a victory against Western influence in the region. And uh, then I will, this is a, um, I think the general introduction of the security matters and I would like to move uh, to bilateral relations. Um, it's a photo of Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei visiting the Armenian family uh, on January 6. Uh, it's a family of uh, Armenian martyr that participated in the war um, against Iraq from the 1980s to 1988. Um, I think it symbolizes the important Armenian presence in the region and uh, also the kind of a transnational links and bonds of the people in the South Caucasus and uh, also uh, the Islamic Republic. There's a strong uh, presence of Armenian community there and as you know there are a lot of Azerbaijanis in the Islamic Republic as well and um, Azerbaijani identity has a big presence in Iranian territories. So to start um, the section of bilateral relations, I'd like to pay attention on the matter of uh, the ties with Azerbaijan. This might, uh, is the very complicated topic that caused a lot of headaches for me personally. Uh, there were very high expectations when Azerbaijan became independent. The Islamic Republic, so this Shia community on its north, and thought that here, after the humiliation of Turkmen Chai, um, the kind of dissolution of the Russia and the Soviet Empire, and the people of Azerbaijan will rejoin their cultural, ideological orbit. There, when you look into the narratives of um, 1990s, you see Iranian newspapers saying that in Azerbaijan they mourn the death of our of the leader of our revolution. So they carry the values of the revolution. So there were high expectations, but they were unmet. Later Azerbaijan was a different uh, path. Uh, the Islamic Republic uh, did not uh, cope with this development. Till today, Azerbaijan's relations with Israel, with the West, are always a constant source of uh, frustration. And at the same time, the Islamic Republic does not want to give out the label of brotherly relations or seeing Azerbaijan as, um, as a country that they have lost to the enemy in an ideological battle. So this is why I wrote Azerbaijan in Iranian discourses is seen as a battleground between Iran's Russia's ideologies and then the so-called sinister ideologies of global arrogance. This is why the uh, Iranian side always tries to, at an official level, keep the narrative that relations with Azerbaijan are, can never be troubled, are always cordial, but there are constant frustrations. That's why when the process trace the development in these bilateral relations, you see a wave of um, 
crisis and reconciliation. Crisis and reconciliation. And it goes on and on and on. And what um, the two sides have developed is called something that one of the Iranian officials says, marital policy. They always have this mantra that whenever there is a situation, they should have frequent encounters between Iran and Azerbaijan officials. The American folks, first, they uh, validate the commitment of both countries to keeping the relations uh, cordial. But at the same time, they also show the necessity of holding such talks because there is always an issue. These issues are kind of postponed and never fully resolved, such as Azerbaijani identity, the disagreements in the case of the Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan's cooperation with Israel, and also more recently the issues considered concerning the so-called Zangezu corridor and Iran kind of trying to cut Azerbaijan, um, and cut Azerbaijan trying to cut Iran from regional community. Kishas in the way of monopolizing uh, this, uh, transactions and also having a strategic uh, privilege that goes against the world's interest. So, I, this is something that we should keep in mind that these relations are always going to have sore points, but at the same time, there are red lines that there's two sides of the cross. I want to say this because. When um, there was a point of tension between Baku and Tehran, usually I would get calls from my father asking, is something changing? Is this a big geopolitical shift? Is uh, Iran becoming pro Armenian? Are they going to help us? My answer usually is no. Uh, there's a certain level of Iran's engagement and preparedness to uh, navigate in uh, this uh, tension with the other countries. Then, then um, when it comes to the relations with Armenia, um, it had a difficult start because of the nagorno karabakh conflict. Uh, in the early 1990s, the Islamic Republic was uh, quite hesitant uh, to cooperate with the Armenian side. This changed after the 1994 ceasefire agreement and Armenia, in a way, um, being um, having strategic partnership with Russia was seen in the Islamic Republic as a, uh, as a preferable alternative to Armenia having a Western orientation or ties with, um, let's say, countries such as the West, and Israel. So in this way, there was this um, atmosphere that they cannot expect uh, anti-Iranian posture from the Armenian side. But the problem in Iran and Armenia relations is uh, slow progress. And um, I was, I thought I was reading the same materials over and over again when I was uh, going over the archival text and seeing how Iranian and Armenian officials need sign a memorandum of understanding on constructing railways, the gas pipeline, the electricity dams, highways, and then the kind of dispersing. A year later, it happens again. A decade later, it happens again. The same discourse over and over again. Seems like I was in the loop of uh, this um, archival materials. The interesting part here is that uh, the, they put forward a very uh, ambitious um, projects, but very few of them get implemented actually. One exception was the one Armenia gas pipeline, and even in this case there were a lot of this. But I argue that there is a reason for keeping these issues on the agenda, because it has a performative factor for the Islamic Republic. They want to show um, their role in the regional affairs, discussions of long-term projects, uh, reproduces the commitment to long-term friendship, and at the same time, it shows that Iran is a big player. So this is what I call, more from the theoretical approach, a recognitive practice, saying that Iran performs these roles of discussing big projects in order to perform the role of a regional player. That's why we, we see the same things happening again and again, even if they don't lead to the um, also, one of the uh, 
government. The topic is this one billion target of trade relation. In 2011, Ali Akbar Salehi, the foreign minister of the Islamic Republic, said that we are dissatisfied with the level of trade with Armenia and we want to hit the target of one billion. Uh, comes the next foreign minister, says that, the current foreign minister is saying that, uh, as of now, I think the trade level is still at a little over 300 million. This is something uh, the Islamic Republic wants to keep um, like the narrative of uh, the prospect of developing relations, the prospect of Iran having a big presence uh, in Armenia and also in the region. Um, okay, and when it comes to um, relations with Georgia, um, here I have a photo of Shebab Nazar, uh, who is well known in the Islamic Republic because he was supposed to be the messenger of Khomeini's letter to Gorbachev. And Khomeini was carrying out the perestroika. Gorbachev was carrying out the perestroika. Khomeini, um, the leader of the Iranian revolution, drafted a letter to Gorbachev saying that uh, he should follow the principles of the Iranian revolution in order to construct a just society. Obviously, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, this letter was not considered as an alternative to their policies. But um, Shevard Nazar was someone, in a way, a familiar face in the Islamic Republic. And him visiting Iran after the collapse of the Soviet Union kind of created a sense of familiarity and it helped to construct relations between Iran and Georgia very easily. Although, uh, here's an interesting thing. Expectations were not very high. In, this is a, in stark contrast from relations with Azerbaijan. There were high expectations, and once those expectations are not met, there's constant frustration and constant demanding and complaining. In the case of Georgia, uh, the Islamic Republic did not have ambitions. Relations, when you look into the data, you see even after two decades, they're still in the mode of exploring how can we cooperate, what are the limits of our cooperation. And uh, eventually, they, they, they become routinized and habitual uh, in a way that they need to discuss certain projects, some of them get implemented depending on the scale, but there is always a, a knowledge really to how far this relation can go. So, this is an overview of the bilateral ties, and you can see how different they are in each case. Also, when we and I put them together with Iran's policies that goes beyond bilateral relations, such as uh, its overall attitude towards regional issues and the uh, attitude towards uh, the security framework, we can see that there is no single strategy, something that you could call an Iran grand strategy towards the South Coast. There are moments of experimentation, moments of hesitance, ambivalence. In some cases, uh, there are um, practices that seek recognition for the Islamic Republic as a regional power. And, uh, and then what's, uh, I think, very important is that certain aspects uh, in Iran's relations with the members of the states in the South Caucasus are brought up of not top-down ideational thinking, but routines and practices. Certain aspects became the norm as they were repeated over time and time, such as exchanging um, um, uh, uh, comments on their preparedness to cooperate with one another, having discussions on economic projects, and then uh, kind of uh, sending reassurances that they would not uh, cross uh, uh, certain red lines. So uh, it's kind of a, a little bit strange to talk about drug process in this region in such an abstract manner, but um, if you would like to know more details about this, I would like to share some of I've spent a lot of time chasing those details. I uh, would be very happy to answer them to the Q&A section. Thank you. We will lead the discussion. Any questions? Yes. I have lots of questions. Oh, that's great. Being from Iran originally, uh, 
Uh, you, when you were discussing the money, naturally relations with Azerbaijan, you mentioned uh, the relation that Azerbaijan has with Israel as, a, as an issue for Iran. But you didn't mention the relation, the fact that Azerbaijan identifies more with Turkey than with Iran. And that is a sore point, as is the fact that the, the, the pan-Turkic idea of uh, if this corridor realizes, then you have a Turkey band north of Iran. So from that point of view, Armenia must be extremely strategic for Iran. Uh, I would like to hear your points, but one other question, if, if do you know what view, what, what, uh, how they see the solution with our Arsaf problem, uh, Arsaf status? Do they see that as uh, some kind of autonomous or uh, independent entity within Azerbaijan? Do they have a view on that or not? First, yes, the narrative of Azerbaijan kind of choosing its kind of Turkey ethnic oriented identity and building a self grounded was very prevalent in the narrative. So, the special present uh, became present during uh, LGBT's uh, presidency uh, in Azerbaijan when uh, it became a sort of point in Iran's relations with Baku because the LGBT had the very uh, strong and very explicit pro-British attitude. And there were also irritantist claims towards the so-called South Azerbaijan and uniting the Turkish world. So yeah, this is a very sore point. And when I mentioned about building north-south axis between Iran, Russia, and Armenia, it was usually considered to be against Turkey uh, and Azerbaijan and the West. So the, these narratives are always there, but what's important is that they are not necessarily the dominant narratives of Azerbaijan's agency. There are also narratives that consider Azerbaijan as a product of nations with whom Iran cannot afford to move on um, severe ties. It cannot afford to consider Azerbaijan near than anything. So this is why we see constant clashes between Azerbaijan being an uh, agent so to say, of Iran's competitors and enemies in the region, and at the same time being a brother of the country with whom there's great potential to develop relations. And uh, this is one of the aspects that creates suspicions in this one problem. It's also an issue that cannot be resolved over a short period of time or for certain negotiations. That's why it constantly comes up, and that's why Iranians and other Bajanis have to. Um, we established their commitment to friendly relations because there was a um, one situation when um, Iran was holding talks uh, with Turkey and Azerbaijan on trilateral cooperation. It was something that was meant to create a framework for uh, this partnership, and this is exactly when uh, Azerbaijan signed the military deal with Israel to buy $1.6 billion worth of weapons. And then all of a sudden the discourse changes to uh, Azerbaijan standing as on the back. There's this expression that is used to describe Iran's relations with Azerbaijan. It's called, um, I think, one side, a relations of one side with respect. Then that Iran tries to reach out build this uh, relations with the broader community and the Azerbaijan government is acting against Iran. Um, uh, the other question is concerning what position do, um, does the Islamic Republic have? Um, it depends who you ask in the Islamic Republic. Saying that the overall Iranian state has a certain position, there is no such thing. Uh, at the level of technocrats, they protect uh, the, the principle of territorial integrity. 
the official narrative that will be more exclusive was that uh, Azerbaijan's territorial integrity should be restored, but the rights of the community, the Christian community in Karabakh should be protected. And that's the official line. Then you have the IRGC affiliated circles saying that this kind of changes the geopolitical balance towards the pro turkish entities in the region and uh, tacitly or the pretext is that we would rather have um, Armenian autonomy in the region and not have Azerbaijan as a But what's very clear is that they are against uh, the corridor that bypasses Iran or I don't know, giving a certain territoriality status to Azerbaijani uh, highways or railways that are hypothetically to pass through Sunni to not Iran. And we are very against to any territorial claims towards uh, Sunni uh, in, this, in their view that this narrative of Yemen backside. So this, I, this is how I would present. Uh, and the position of this one when it comes to the conflict in the cycles. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is you said that uh, Russia and Iran have uh, some common interest in this region, like keeping the anti Western East. Uh, so, what are the Conflicting interests that have in this region that we discussed in the discussion. And then uh, Azerbaijani uh, identity uh, towards uh, Iran that you mentioned. My question is does this conflict uh, still exist? Or so were we just referring it as a conflict that existed some years ago but it was buried once uh, the party of Stanley came to be power in Azerbaijan? It's a, uh, I'll start from the latter. Um, there is, there are no big dividendist tendencies in the north of Iran that will tend to um, create southern Azerbaijan or joining Azerbaijan. But there is some sense of a um, revival of local Azerbaijan identity. You can see this during football matches, for example. When the football team of Tabriz is playing against the football team of Ebtera versus Polis, you can see some uh, heated exchanges on the ethnic grounds, and this kind of leads to this uh, articulation of Azerbaijani identity being a little bit separate from the wider Iran itself. But it's a point of frustration for Iran. Um, but it's a manageable issue. For example, recently, they had this Congress of World Azerbaijan as well, and there were people presenting there who had identity claims. Then later, they had this diplomatic conference on of think tanks or diplomatic matters in Shuji, where a politology, an Iranian scholar, made a complaint saying that you're hosting people who are making identity claims towards and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Aliyev responded to that saying, but these are not officials. Um, well, they have a platform to say whatever they want, but uh, at an official, on official level, uh, a high-ranking Azerbaijani government representative would not make any choice for something like that. So that, although Iran is not happy that there are people who use this platform to um, disseminate such narratives, but since there is no government, um, the, there is no discourse coming from the Aliyev himself, um, it's, it's a manageable frustration. And when it comes to Russia, um, Iran's complaint is that we are acting more ideologically on some matters regarding our partnership, but Russia is being very tactical. And uh, in some cases, they could cooperate with Iran, but in another situation, they would choose to kind of abstain uh, from further partnership, or moreover, use, let's say, the 
sanctions against Iran to take advantage of the situation. Also, Russia is an energy competitor in the region for this country. But there is still this narrative in Iran that uh, its um, supply of uh, gas to Armenia could have been bigger if it were for Russia or Iran could have constructed also sophisticated uh, oil transportation means to Armenia if it were for Russia. So this is why there is this flashing point uh, that, is, um, that, uh, the, that kind of creates, reproduces suspicion towards Russia that also has a his imperial history uh, for several hundred years and uh, which amplifies such discourses. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Uh, we often hear in, in the media various statements credited to the Revolutionary Guard, true or false, about Iran's commitment to our ministry towards integrity and because there is a huge gap between our information spaces, oftentimes uh, fake news is sold uh, very uh, convincingly. Uh, if, if that's true, if, if our ministry of territorial integrity is indeed, uh, and I would like to hear your comment on that, a red line for, for Iran, isn't that uh, when compared into your theory regarding Iran's duality in its commitment, not too much, but not too, too little. Is that standing uh, outside of the duality? Is it too much commitment uh, when, when looked from the prism of that theory? Uh, when it comes to the rhetoric, um, the revolutionary guards of the Islamic Republic have been very flamboyant and very powerful. And I, uh, I think I have an idea of what you were there. There was a video uh, disseminated by a social media account affiliated with the revolutionary guard called the Khatem al which is the red line showing this Armenia on the map shining and this like territory are highlighted saying that Iran would not let that happen. It's something that is yet to be tested uh, because I think the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is a landmark event, is a big enough event that might change Iran's attitude, but I, I'm still very skeptical. Uh, I still think Iran will try to do everything short of military engagement. Uh, this could be rhetorical pressure, this could be economic pressure, diplomatic pressure, many other things, but um, there is no precedent of direct military engagement in this region. It will very much go against something that has become a convention in the Iranian foreign policy in the South Caucasus, basically keeping our troops out. Even during the April war and the war in 2020, when there were crossfires um, in the Iranian territory, so the Iranian still remain very restrained. And the same can be said also concerning the situation in the early 1990s when um, they brought their troops near to the border, but they couldn't go much further than that. So I don't know if the Islamic Republic, if let's say Azerbaijan starts a conflict with Armenia, goes or something, and the Islamic Republic engages in a fighting against Azerbaijan on Armenia's side, I would say this is a very, very uh, big deviation from Iran's attitude. Other questions? Yeah. On the issue of the gas line, it was my understanding that Russia put a limit on how much gas could be transported from Iran. So it wasn't really uh, Armenia and Iran not succeeding. In, it was, is, is that correct? Uh, it's wrong. Uh, not succeeding, but like um, uh, what I'm trying to say regarding the gas pipe is that it took a lot of effort to construct it. First, it was uh, the construction was supposed to start in 2002, it started in 2004, then it was going to be used in 2006, but then it was delayed again, and then it started uh, becoming commercial, but then 
it's called for a while until we started in 2009. Um, and also, the issue of the first diameter of the gas pipeline, uh, how wide it could be, so we should give it a potential of becoming a transnational pipeline. So they have a narrow gas pipeline and, uh, which kind of pulls out the main transnational. So this is uh, what we had. The, uh, on the one hand, we had uh, some complicatedness that comes to the protracted process of infrastructure development. And on the other hand, we have pressure from Russia, but also pressure from the United States. For example, when you read uh, the memoirs by Bachmann, Ostrana, and Robert Petrian, we can see that there was this dynamic. That, well, what I try to say is that they discussed a lot of projects, but doing one of them took so much effort and so much time, but that didn't lead to revising let's say, do one small project and uh, they kept the uh, uh, framework of mutual cooperation and negotiations very wide because they want to show that um, they keep this prospect of large-scale uh, engagement alive. This, this is why I want to emphasize how it's a more of a performance and status of the group. Thanks for your question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I suggest you know that there was a uh, way which passed from uh, India by sea to Iran and there should have been constructed a road which could pass uh, from Armenia or from Azerbaijan and then it uh, went to Georgia and to Black Sea. Uh, do you think uh, it is beneficial? Which option is beneficial for Iran to uh, for that road to pass? Uh, via Armenia or via Azerbaijan? Both. Both. That would be the uh, short answer. This, uh, I assume you referred to the International North South Health Corridor and it's a cooperation that was initiated in the early 2000s with, with Russia and India and then Iran was involved. Iran tried to become an intermediary. Uh, what's important for the Islamic Republic when it comes to the South of so having alternatives, not relying on one country in the region too much. So it has, it has highways and pipelines going both to Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, depending on the level of relations, it, uh, it makes the Islamic Republic less sensitive towards the points of tension and issues that have created with this relation. So for Iran, it's important to have Armenia as, a, as an alternative to the drug corridors passing through Azerbaijan. Because otherwise, Azerbaijan could use it as leverage to get concessions from this one. So this is the reason uh, in Iran as well. Any other questions? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. From your speech, I understood that um, there have been attempts, as you mentioned, to have uh, infrastructure projects in Iran, but especially it was during the previous administration in Armenia. Uh, if you compare the current government and the previous government in terms of the relations with Iran, and uh, like, what could you highlight in terms of difference between wanting to do the projects, not being able to do them? Um, I would say uh, there is more continuity than change. In 2019, there was a conference at the American University of Armenia that presented a paper how Iran's relations with Armenia changed after the Velvet Revolution. And my observation was that um, this is a relation that kind of moves forward slowly and is a sedimented practice. There are certain routines, certain topics that are constantly discussed. When you look into the topics that are discussed, that were discussed by Nikol Pashinyan when he visited Iran and uh, looking to the talks that were discussed by Serge Arsan when he was in Iran, uh, you can see a lot of overlaps. The same issue of one billion, bridging the one billion dollar trade, um, Armenia and Iran becoming uh, intermediaries for each other to access the Black Sea and the Persian Gulf infrastructure projects and development. So this, you could see like the same narratives happening. It seems like at some point these relations with Armenia and 
also in Georgia, are put on a train and then pushed forward and they're moving forward through the force of inertia. And when some political changes happen, they don't really influence uh, much of what's happening in these locations. Is it? So if you have observed that there is some change in Armenia's attitude or change in Armenia's commitment, and I would love to hear it, but uh, it's not something substantial that I thought. Oh, there was just one incident that Shirin and Babdi, when she visited Armenia, um, she was in Armenia when Nikol Pashina was a prisoner. And then, secondly, she came to Armenia, so Nikol Pashina as prime minister, and uh, Shirin and Babdi is a vocal Iranian activist and Nobel Prize winner, and um, Pashina made this very, as he usually does, expressive comment about how uh, the surprise of the Nobel Prize winner shows where Armenia was and where we are now. But Shri Evadi is someone who is not very welcome in the Islamic Republic. So on a diplomatic you know, note, this was uh, considered in Iran not a very tactical move because you are praising engaging in a figure that is not welcome by the Iranian government. So it should be very clear. So the issues between Armenia and Iran usually happen on this level. Some Armenia does something, and then the Iranians are like, you should not do that. For example, Armenia cinema showed the movie 300 Spartans, and the Iranians started complaining about it, because, yes, uh, we are promoting the dissemination of uh, orientalization and uh, like hatred towards the Islamic Republic. So, yeah, uh, you, you had to to see in the archives how the cultural attacher goes to her, like the Armenian television, saying you should not show this movie on TV. <laughs> this, is, this, this is like the level of sometimes the issues that we have. And it's not comparable to like the problems they have with the Vidas and Burma, which is on a very, very large scale. But there's still this commitment of we cannot change our attitude and consider this as an enemy because that would be an ideological teaching on our side. Because we, what kind of a country we are as an Islamic Republic, if we have enmity with the neighboring Shi, small Shia community. So that's, that's the logic that we have. Okay, other questions? So, um, Alin, I have um, two questions. Um, when the so Soviet Union was about to collapse. I want to know um, what was the strategic thinking in, in Iran? Uh, how they viewed the South Caucasus? Was it seen as a former territory controlled by um, uh, Persia that needs a new uh, cultural um, uh, reconquista, let's say? Oh, oh, there were different variations of how to view the South Caucasus. Um, so, particularly 1891, this period is interesting. The other question is about um, uh, Iran's, uh, Iran's attitude and interpretation of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. There are three occasions that you can see, you can feel the uh, Iran's, um, you can see Iran's uh, attitude to the conflict. 1992 May Shushi operation and then Karvaja operation uh, and then uh, the helicopter accident in 1994. But other than that, uh, how Armenian armed forces moved along the Iranian border and made the Iranian uh, Karabakh border three times longer uh, than the Armenian border. So how that uh, advancement of Armenian armed forces was um, presented in the Iranian public discourse? Uh, questions. So I want to answer the first question by showing this photo. This is River Arax. This is near Nazarbayev. On the one side you see uh, people standing there from Azerbaijan, and on the one side you see people from Iran. And this gathering happened in 19, starting from 1987, 1988, 1989, and it's uh, uh, so people would go there and chant slogans. Joining with their relatives. In Iranian media, this was presented as a symbol of return after the collapse, uh, after the historic cultural return or ideological return of uh, people of the South Caucasus, especially Azerbaijanis, to the Iranian orbit. Um, it's important to note that uh, Iran was for the historic, but 
they were very hesitant towards the collapse of the Soviet Union because that meant uncertainty, that meant new um, hotspots in a neighboring area and the Islamic Republic just got out of the war. They needed this period of rehabilitation, but they were scared of the idea of this uncertainty. But they were encouraged, they were encouraging the opening by the Gorbachev government saying that this gives them an opportunity to make contact with the people in the region. That's why when Prof. Sanjani, uh, who was the head of the Iranian parliament in 1989, he had this visit to Moscow. It was meant to be a landmark event in Soviet-Iran relations. Then after that, he visited Baku. And uh, this uh, visit to Baku was meant to symbolize the uh, establishment of cultural ties between Iran and the Azerbaijan community while respecting the territorial integrity of Soviet Union and not, not meddling in its interests. They tried to put forward both of the narratives that uh, they respect uh, the territorial integrity of the Soviet Union, but they want more active presence in the lives of Azerbaijanis and in Soviet Azerbaijan. Um, second question referring to the stages of Iran's reactions to the the concept in the war in the Um Things have changed uh, in the discourse after May 1998, when they uh, learned their better examples in Iran. He was signing this 10 point um, deal uh, with the Azerbaijani side, mediated by the Azerbaijani government, and then Armenian forces took Shushi right after that. And then the narrative of the Iranian side changed that the Armenians should stop the aggression. Uh, this uh, aggression became the signifier that kind of described the, at the, the position of the Islamic Republic towards Armenia. First, they um, called the Armenian side to stop it. Then, throughout the summer and fall of 1993, those calls were turned to warnings because Armenia was advancing towards the south, uh, near Iran's borders, and this was considered as a, um, as a dangerous development and pushed a lot of refugees towards the Islamic Republic, and also it could create clashes near the border. So then there were these more warnings. But it should be stated that uh, the Armenian community in the Islam, uh, in Iran, played an important role kind of dismantling any narrative that presented Armenia as the enemy or the perpetrators of aggression that oppressed Shia Muslims under the ambassadors of, uh, of the West of the global arrogance forces. And, uh, what the Armenian community did is they kind of tried to show that they are also victims of the situation. And this narrative became very vocal inside the Islamic Republic. Also, they tried to articulate uh, Turkey as the enemy, as a NATO member. This is also something that kind of became an alternative interpretation. What's also interesting is that uh, Iranian officials at the level of deputy ministers, they also sometimes say that the Armenian government does not necessarily have full control over what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh, especially the efforts of government. They would say that these are local forces who are expanding. Uh, that the person is calling them to stop, to restart the negotiation process, so they're not agree. So they kind of try to de detach the developments in that area, in Nagorno Karabakh and the Jackson territories, from the official position of the Armenian government, saying that they're more collaborative. So these narratives did not necessarily become very dominant, but they dismantled this uh, parsimonious ideological. Um, interpretation of Christian Armenians um, sponsored by the West, by the oppressor against resisting uh, oppressed Shia Muslims. So this, this a few narratives were put forward that uh, created a multiplicity in the Iranian discourses space, and none of them was dominant. And, and then the situation kind of was kept this way until the ceasefire agreement. So this, this was like fascinating 
about the situation in Iran in that period. A lot of, lot of ideas, a lot of uh, policy options, and a lot of discourses are being thrown around. And Do you discuss this in your dissertation? Yeah, I've done it pretty much the gist of it. It's like they lose the details and I try to do that. All right. Um, other questions? Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, I Alan. Mean, um, I already had a chance to come and talk to our students when we were discussing Iran, uh, the, trans the, the transformation of Iran in the 20th century. So, um, we are, I guess everybody in here is looking very much forward to reading um, the monograph. And uh, we wish you success uh, and uh, do publish that, please. I guess it's very much needed in your country and also, um, and also just an anonymous scholar speaking about uh, this very interesting topic um, from this very interesting theoretical perspective. So um, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Alan. Thank you for coming. Thank you for